out on bail awaiting his next extradition hearing. Who are you? I am Arthur Knight and this is my wife, Miranda Knight. And unfortunately there are those who are claimed differently. Are you Nicholas Rossi? No. Are you that Nicholas Alaverdian? Absolutely not. Are you Nicholas Brown? Yes. When asked why he changed his name from Nicholas to Arthur, he replied because it was associated with bad childhood experiences in Northern Ireland. Miranda, who claims she married her husband in Bristol two years ago, says she was there when Police Scotland arrested her husband in hospital as he recovered from COVID. Arrivals to court for bail hearings were in a wheelchair. An oxygen mask remained on throughout this interview at their Glasgow home. I nearly died. I nearly died, and we, uh, we are terrified. How can I be a flight risk if I can't even stand? The electric wheelchair is not a prop. There's no faking of this illness. This is a case of mistaken identity. You say you've never been to the United States? Never in my life. They claimed in court you were identified from tattoos. That is not true. There is no evidence whatsoever that um, uh, there are tattoos and I've shown that to news reporter after news reporter. In this interview with a US network, he did agree to roll up one sleeve. It was up further, right? And have you had any tattoos removed? The man wanted in America to face a rape charge is known to have multiple tattoos. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a ride. This guy's something else. Let's just start by saying the more times you do something and get away with it, the more comfortable you become in it. So if you've used 50 names, it's really easy for you to spit out those 50 names. That's the organism doing what made the organism successful, whatever you categorize successful. However, the more of the stuff that you put on yourself, the harder it is to read. All these accoutrements that make you harder to read by putting on a hat and glasses and, you know, people do it for disguise in a joking manner on things like Colombo and those kinds of places. This guy's Mr. Potato Head. He's got more stuff going than you can even possibly imagine imagine the little stevie ray vaughn hat that he comes in then he's gonna have a different hat a new hat and a different pair of glasses he's trying to hide something right off you can't miss that the other thing that really really jumps off the plate at me is when a person is short of breath and talks like this their breathing changes too because their breathing is why they're talking like that not this guy immediately the first thing you notice is he's breathing normally and talking in choppy movements and then I mean, it's just so much stuff here. What does happen to him is when he gets into a point where he is not thinking, it's just like the crying thing. I tell you guys all the time. The first thing I learned in body language is if a person's crying and they're faking it, if you ramp up the pressure, that part of their brain turns off and they the tears dry up. The same thing happens to him. That erratic breathing, supposedly erratic breathing that's causing him to talk that way goes away when he gets into a bind. When he's asked those, when he's asked about the tattoos, the choppy answers and slower breaths, then you can't miss him because he distances the question. There is no evidence for tattoos. And I have shown it, and you hear that cadence shift in the way he's talking, and he starts eye blocking immediately. This is just one of my favorite things we've touched ever in the beginning. Mark, what do you got on this one? Yeah, oh, okay. Mark, so, Mark, the accent too, by the way, while we're talking about it. Oh, you know, the accent is is really interesting. I'll go through a few of the accents that he's that he's going through uh, over this, and where I think they come from, and and uh, you know how they might be some kind of alibi for him at some point. Uh, first of all, let me start off with George Orwell, nineteen eighty four. Uh, George Orwell said, "How does a, a man uh, assert their power over another?" People often go, "Well, it's got to be fear or something like that." Orwell said it was suffering, suffering. And so, if you could get somebody to suffer enough, you would have power over them. I think, and I'm going to put forward over the course of these uh, videos that. This person uses suffering as the con. The more he can lay up suffering, the more power his con has, or at least that's what's going on in his mind. The more he can convince you that he's suffering, the more you might go, okay, well, then you have the power. I have nothing. I'm going to stand down that you might be from a wholly different country and actually be uh, a perpetrator that we're looking for. 
So, look, well, first of all, uh, are you Nicholas Rossi? Eyes go up. I don't care whether they're going to the uh, up to the left or up to the right, or even if they went down, or I don't really mind where they go. But it is such a deviation from what we've seen elsewhere that you kind of go, well, okay, w- you know, what's that? What's going on there around your name? But then you just go, why do you need to look anywhere for your name? Why anywhere? Like, if it's your name you know what your name is. If it's not your name, you know it's not your name. There's too much of a pause there, too much of a deviation from from anything, really. Um, So why does he need to think about it? Look, here's the suffering. Bad childhood experiences in Northern Ireland. I mean, yeah, sure, if you were a kid in Northern Ireland, you could have some really, really awful childhood experiences. And so if somebody says, hey, I've had some really bad childhood experiences in Northern Ireland, if you're British, uh, if you're English, you're probably going to lay off a little bit because you don't want to, you know, touch sensitive issues there. So the suffering has gone to a high point uh, right from moment one. COVID, I nearly died. Okay, massive suffering. Number two there, I can't stand. So this is a person who doesn't even have uh, legs. So the suffering is huge. He's presenting something of a of an aristocratic style to him as well. Somebody who maybe had money but 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 doesn't anymore. You've got the slippers with the embroidery on them, uh, two gold signet rings that he wears. They kind of suggest that he might be from a from a, a high status family. You've got the the busts in the background, the statues in the background. You've got the Wedgwood there. You've got the big club chair that he might be uh, a lord. You've even got the name, uh, Arthur Knight. You'll know that knights and the knights of the round table and the most important one was called Arthur, King Arthur. That's, I mean, that's a good name to choose if you want to be up at that high status. So at this point, he's pretty much playing that kind of Sir Bernard Chumley kind of role, uh, defunct, uh, uh, soft aristocrat. Uh, we, we'll see him later on in his Zorro hat, uh, very similar to John Lennon, Spaniard in the works there. So working class hero, strange kind of uh, romantic working class hero. So he really is romanticizing himself here. When you romanticize yourself, it's often not a blend in situation. Uh, I could talk for hours on that first one. Uh, Chase, what, what do you got on this? Yeah, let me go in detail on the eye movement thing here. When you're being asked about your name and whether or not you're someone that you're not, there will be no accessing or eye movement. We move our eyes around all the time. And you can think of eye movement as an information retrieval process. So when something's not really available, we move our eyes to find that information in our brain. But when someone asks you a question that you know for certain, there is zero eye movement. And in Honest People, you can try this out yourself by asking somebody what color their car is, what the street number of their house is. There's not going to be any movement. And these two pieces of information are exponentially less important than somebody's name. Secondly, the massive red flag here is when he's asked about the tattoos. He doesn't say anything about him not being the person, not having the tattoos at all. He defaults there being no evidence that the tattoos even exist. And this is where the interviewer could have exposed him on the spot. But when it comes to interviewing people and needing to get raw information, sometimes it's best to build these up like ammo until later in the conversation uh, so that you can dig some more. So calling somebody out early, they'll build up a wall uh, most of the time. So that's maybe what's going on here. Scott, what do you got? I, 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 I don't know how to approach this because it's so obvious. It's grotesque to me. And it's it. And I've been telling these guys before we get on here, I said, I think that there's 3% chance this might be some kind of a, a an artistic bit this guy's doing, even though he's going to go to prison or whatever. I, I, I still can't, I can't wrap my head around somebody continuing to think somebody would believe this. So what I'm going to do as I'm, I'm not going to focus as much on body language because I, I think it's it's so blatantly obvious. Um, I'm going to talk talk about what a con does and his approach from that. Um, Greg and I have a, a course called um, the True Crime Workshop, and that focuses on liars, killers, and cons. And this goes down the classic lines of what a con does and how they approach their their con. And that's what this guy's trying to do. Uh, personally, I don't think he's pulling it off. 
But the first thing, so I'll give you, I'll give you nine or 10 little things, little tips to go by. So if you spot a, someone you think might be a con, these, these will give you a heads up as you're going uh, through your experience with them. Charm and charisma. Um, quite often they'll use their charm and charisma. They'll be so nice that, that that over the top almost that you won't be able to believe it when you first meet them. They'll just be so agreeable to everything and it'll be wonderful, especially if there's a lot of, uh, if you're in a position where they can get something where there's a lot of money or there's a piece of property they want, something like that. So the first thing we we'll want to watch out for is, is, or just keep an eye open for is how charismatic someone is. If it starts feeling a little bit creepy, we also talk about that when it comes to psychopathy and, and, and quite often the con is a psychopath. I don't think this guy is at all, but keep an eye out or keep your head open for that charisma. That seems just a little bit over the top. Sometimes it's way over the top, but keep an eye open for that because that'll, that'll start, um, that'll give you the heads up to start collecting information about this person as you go along some of these other tips that I'll give you. One of those tape replays. Out on bail, awaiting his next extradition hearing. Who are you? Hi, I'm Arthur Knight, and this is my wife, Miranda Knight. And unfortunately, they're all those who would claim differently. Are you Nicholas Rossi? No. Are you that Nicholas Alaverdian? Absolutely not. Are you Nicholas Brown? Yes. When asked why he changed his name from Nicholas to Arthur, he replied because it was associated with bad childhood experiences in Northern Ireland. Miranda, who claims she married her husband in Bristol two years ago, says she was there when Police Scotland arrested her husband in hospital as he recovered from COVID. Arrivals to court for bail hearings were in a wheelchair. An oxygen mask remained on throughout this interview at their Glasgow home. I nearly died. I nearly died, and we, uh, we are terrified. How can I be a flight risk if I can't even stand? The electric wheelchair is not a prop. There's no faking of this illness. This is a case of mistaken identity. You say you've never been to the United States? Never in my life. They claimed in court you were identified from tattoos. That is not true. There is no evidence whatsoever that um, uh, there are tattoos and I've shown that to news reporter after news reporter. In this interview with a US network, he did yeah, agree to roll up one sleeve. It was up further, right? Oh, oh. And have you had any tattoos removed? The man wanted in America to face a rape charge is known to have multiple tattoos. If you like this video, Get the full body language breakdown and analysis on our main channel by clicking this video right here.